it's not very is it is it working okay thank you <laughs> yeah <laughs> for the online audience apparently it, it's important <laughs> and i think we'll we'll probably start on time just because of the online audience and just to be mindful of that so welcome everyone to a fireside chat about communities as users and generators of evidence and really taking stock of community data, knowledge, information needs. My name is Lisa McNamara and I work for South South North, which is an NGO based in Cape Town. So I welcome you as, as the host. <laughs> Um, and it's uh, it's great to great to have everyone here in the mother city. And I also work on a program called the Climate and Development Knowledge Network, and we focus on moving diverse forms of knowledge into action on climate change. And I'm joined here by a wonderful group of speakers who are going to be bringing lots and lots of different diverse perspectives to the what of evidence around community communities and. The, the communities track. And before before we kick off, I'm just going to hand over to Suchi Vora, who's going to give just a little bit of framing for the for the session and what the purpose of the session is, what the vision for the session is, and why we all gathered here today to talk about community knowledge needs. Thank you. That's uh, great to see you all, uh, firstly. Uh, Post-lunch sessions are hard, so uh, thank you for being present. Um, so very quickly about this session, we, are, uh, we thought we'd start with this aspect of um, community knowledge needs and community data evidence and measurement needs as a center of how we measure because uh, that's a question that probably gets left. As much as we, we say it needs to come to the fore, we probably leave that as an afterthought. So that's, that's where we want to kind of find common ground between existing measurement approaches and uh, community-led or community-based bottom-up approaches, which uh, both of which often tend to be seen as two separate, very divergent uh, Ways of ways of measuring resilience. Uh, we have ongoing efforts from our online and offline speakers here, uh, who will be who will be sharing how they're trying to find that common ground. And and we'll probably, I mean, uh, what we want to kind of what what we want want to kind of explore is when when measuring is hard. How do we do it? When, when scales are difficult, they're fuzzy, and our problems are complex, uncertain, how do we do it? How do we still keep uh, the community's needs at the center of, of how we are measuring? So that's, that's largely where we're at, and I'll, I'll leave it to these speakers to give, give all the conversations and take on from here. Thank you. Thank you, Suchi. So before, before we begin our fireside chat, which is very appropriate on such a cold winter's day, well, certainly for, for me as a Cape Tonian, it's cold. <laughs> for others, potentially not. So I'd just like to introduce our, our speakers, both here in the room and online. We are, I'm going to put my glasses on, forgive me. <laughs> so Cinderella, Cinderella to my, to my left, is the executive director of an NGO called Green Hut Trust, based in Zimbabwe. And she set up this NGO, given her passion for forging climate change and environmental solutions in her native Zimbabwe. And Green Hut Trust focuses on community-led adaptation, work on environmental awareness and education, and mainstreaming gender into climate change. And Cinderella is also an Afri the, a member of the African Group of Negotiators Expert Support Group. She wears many hats. <laughs> She's also um, a member of the Climate Reality Leadership Corps. Corp. She's been part of the COP27 Zimbabwean delegation. And her 2022 project on food security and food systems was shortlisted by FAO as one of the top 15 best projects. So welcome, welcome Cinderella. I'd like to now also just go online to find Dr. Adame, who's coming to us all the way from Nairobi. Hi, Dr. Adame. Can you see me? 
Yes, can you yes, see we me? can see you. Thank you. Yeah, you, you, do you want to bring your, put your camera down a little bit or move your computer a little bit so we can see you full? Yes, that's much better. <laughs> Super. You are now beamed straight into the room. We've got two very big screens, so we can see you very nicely. <laughs> okay, super. So, Dr. Dame is the founder and director of the Center for African Bioentrepreneurship, and he's a member of the African Research Impact Network, Aaron. And Dr. Dame works in agricultural policy research, and he focuses particularly on agricultural innovation, and bridging the science, technology, and innovation and policy worlds. And he has a keen interest in biotechnology, food security, agribusiness, and smallholder innovation. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Tulika Narayan. Uh, Dr. Tulika is the Vice President of the Climate Change Practice uh, at Mathematica. She works with a diverse team across sectors to design solutions at the intersection of policy, data, and technology in, to address climate change. And Dr. Narayan has more than 20 years of experience in conducting economic analysis and evaluations to support agriculture, climate change, and environmental policy. And last but not least, <laughs> Kazi Zawood Hossein, Kazi is the Climate Resilience and Agricultural Manager of International Development Enterprises, otherwise known as IDE. And Kazi leads IDE's global programming across climate resilience and environmental technical sectors. He has expertise in impact evaluation, GHG accounting, and digital agriculture. And Kazi provides IDE project teams with technical assistance at the nexus of climate change and agriculture. He's developed and commercialized award-winning agro-advisory services, and he was nominated as the Youth Climate Action Champion representing Bangladesh. So as you can see, we've really, really got a great, great group of speakers here who are going to, you know, really explore how we can better find common ground between bottom-up community-led evidence approaches and top-down, often global, often quantitative, sophisticated modeling, and how can we actually find a common ground between these two different, different approaches. So, Cinderella, I'd like to start with you. I'm going to reposition myself a bit better. <laughs> so I'm not just looking at your side profile. Um, so with the, you, you, you received a, a catalytic grant from the catalytic grant program um, of ICAD, the one that was run by ICAD on locally led adaptation. And you've been studying um, how to really understand smallholder perceptions um, of indigenous knowledge practices passed down uh, from one generation to the next via word of mouth and how those are understood by smallholder farmers who often in very remote areas in contrast to more modern, modern climate services meteorological data and how these two very different um, forms of, of, of evidence are assisting farmers to um, adapt their agricultural practices in the face of recurrent droughts. And it would be really great to understand from, from that work, what has this shown you about the, the value of indigenous knowledge? and both, both the value of indigenous knowledge and climate services in, in enabling community resilience. And are, prefer, are farmers preferring one or the other? Okay, thank you so much, Lisa. Hello, everyone. My name is Cinderella. Um, just to give a bit of context, so in the project that we're working on under the catalytic grant by which we um, offered by ICAT, we worked with smallholder rural uh, farmers in a rural district in Zimbabwe in the southwestern region of Zimbabwe. So the southwestern region of Zimbabwe is one of the most heavily impacted regions by climate change and it's manifesting itself in the form of prolonged droughts and dry spells. So as a result, we have um, a lot of smallholder farmers who are still practicing agriculture, which is 
mostly rain fed and as a result they are suffering a lot of losses in terms of their agricultural yields. So in our projects uh, we realized how farmers are still utilizing indigenous knowledge systems to be able to um, inform their agricultural activities. So we have farmers using um, uh, the behavior of particular tree species in their ecosystems or looking at the behaviors of birds as a way of discerning the onset of the rainy season and also maybe um, predicting when is the right time to start planting, etc., etc. So um, within that context now, um, at the same time, uh, you find that um, in the same area, there's also a lot of ecological damage that is going on. Farmers that are still relying on on uh, indigenous on these indigenous knowledge systems now have to uh, use these indigenous knowledge systems in the same context where there's a lot of ecological damage, a lot of deforestation, a lot of land degradation. So, for instance, if you have a farmer who is still on the lookout for the blooming of a particular tree and people in the area are cutting down that particular tree, it means that they are going to miss the sign that they are looking for in terms of trying to identify the sign that they are so familiar with to be able to maybe influence the agricultural activities at the end of the day. So um, on the other hand, again, we are talking about a remote area that is not even, some of the areas, uh, some of the wards, some of the villages are not even accessible by road. That is why even in our um, project um, under the catalytic grant, we also had difficulties accessing some of these areas because it is that remote. And in addition to that, you find that smallholder farmers don't get um, the climate services to be able to maybe um, inform them on what the science says, what are the weather predictions, what are the seasonal variations that are expected. So at the end of the day, you find that in the event that these small water farmers do get hold of the climate information, it comes to them at a very late stage, such that um, it is already too late for them to maybe um, change the kind of seed they wanted to plant based on those predictions. Because um, the issue of um, climate services coming, for example, from the meteorological weather stations, you find that um, one meteorological weather station is, is, is servicing a radius of 100 kilometers, of which you all know how there is partial variation, especially with regards to rainfall. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, if that community, if that um, kind of communication is being disseminated to smallholder farmers and it's not necessarily accurate or portrays what the realities on the ground or I would say ground true thing to the extent that uh, smallholder farmers are, are essentially losing faith in the modern science because the Met Office said it's going to rain but in the villages it didn't rain because the weather station is so fast that it doesn't necessarily pinpoint the actual conditions conditions on the, on the ground. So um, the other thing that um, we also realized again is how um, with regards to smallholder farmers and the indigenous knowledge systems, these indigenous knowledge systems are being passed down from one generation to the next using um, using um, word of mouth. And there's not necessarily the documentation of this information, which um, goes to highlight the danger in um, losing that information with um, increasing intergenerational gap as well, and also other um, issues of um, recyclement, whereby people that are not indigenous, uh, that are not indigenous to that area are moving into that area and might not necessarily be familiar with the um, local indigenous knowledge systems of, of, of that particular area. So it was really a, a complex issue if we're asking them what do they prefer, the local, the local indigenous knowledge systems or the meteorological data because some of them did say they feel like the indigenous knowledge systems are actually working out for them because of the problem that I already highlighted of the fact that there is no accuracy because of the spatial distribution of weather, of weather stations. And others felt that um, um, the MET services works, works, works better for them. Um, looking at um, 
the perceptions as well, even of the young farmers coming into play and how the young generation don't really subscribe to indigenous knowledge systems per se. So it was really a mixed bag of feelings and perceptions mm. to say which one works best. Mm. Interesting that it's a very complex picture that actually that actually emerges. And how do you think one can, given those various perceptions, what do you think are like potentially one biggest opportunity to find common ground between these two quite different um, frameworks? Um, I think it's really important to also um, have communities at the center of locally led adaptation. Because when we're speaking to farmers, they did express um, they did express their discomfort of how because you are small, because you are rural, and because you are this poor farmer, a lot of the times they tend to be recipients of these imposed adaptation methodologies mm. from be it the donor communities or NGOs as such, what is being imposed on them does not necessarily address the challenge they are facing. For example, we have blanket approach agricultural mechanisms that are being imposed on communities that I would say, um, listen guys, we are going to be giving everybody maize seed regardless of the fact that because of climate change, some of the areas are not, some of the areas, maize is no longer viable because of the change in climate. But if that's what the agricultural program is, is about, then it is what it is. The, the farmers are expected to just take what they are given. And we had um, also an example with the community that we're working in, um, giving us an example of how they, at some point, um, sunflower seeds were being issued out and they had no idea what to do with them. They've never farmed sunflower seeds and they had no intentions of farming sunflower seeds, but because this agricultural program imposed or being implemented by so-and-so said, this is what we are handing out to you because we want to address food, secu food insecurity in your community then those farmers at the end of the day feel like they are just recipients of those programs whereby a lot of institutions are coming up, even as practi practitioners from the NGO sector are coming up with programs that we think are helpful, but they are not helpful at the end of the day. So I think it's really important to also consult the community. And in this instance, there's really need to have an integration of both indigenous knowledge systems and, and modern science in the sense that we cannot say we want to eradicate um, indigenous knowledge systems because who knows how long it's going to take to have enough weather stations to cover and give accurate information for all the villages and all the words to service the smallholder farmers. At the same time, we also need to be able to educate and capacitate um, the small rural holder farmers to be able to also uh, find ways in which they can utilize modern science to their advantage to complement the indigenous knowledge system that they, that they already possess. So as part of our project outcomes, we're also trying to come up with an Indigenous, in indigenous knowledge database that we can maybe share even online, something that is going to maybe um, be a resource even to young people that might be in, interested in exploring that. So we hope that maybe with access to more funding, we can even be able to expand the research further to look into local-led adaptation and indigenous knowledge system in a different setting, maybe in a setting whereby it's affected by flash floods vis-a-vis -vis the situation that we're already working in, whereby there are a lot of droughts and dry spells. And to find out how uh, both the, both the um, in both contexts, how are farmers utilizing indigenous knowledge systems, what are the challenges that they are facing, and hopefully also um, through a policy brief that we are sharing with our local authorities to find ways in which we can also influence policy to say that indigenous knowledge systems are also part of science and they also need to be respected um, accordingly in order to, to, um, to address um, locally led adaptation and make it as effective as possible. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much, Cinderella. I'd like to now bring Tulika into the conversation. Tulika, you've been working with, as Mathematica with the Global Centre on Adaptation on scoping out a data platform to give access to communities uh, more global data sets and global um, climate information. And it would be great to understand from you like how what you're finding in this work, scoping out not community needs and how to, in fact, begin to make these, this global, often top-down data more actionable and more relevant in, in, in the community context. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that question, Lisa. And just a quick introduction to Mathematica. Since morning, I've been saying I'm from Mathematica. What does that mean? Uh, so it was started by Princeton mathematicians to bring the same level of rigor to pu public policy. And, and so we interface in this space to bring data science, social science, technology to evaluate programs. And certainly a lot of the work that we've been doing has a global lens, across the country lens. So this work has particularly been very interesting to sort of look at the cutting edge work that is happening and how do you bring it to the communities, how do you bring it to locally data adaptation. So I'll answer your question because we looked at many aspects of evidence needs and to bring the top down and bottom down approaches, but I'll answer it in the context of climate data, global climate data. It also speaks a little bit to what Cinderella said. Uh, and I'll say three things. Uh, so number one is we were doing our qualitative inquiry and speaking with a uh, few um, community-based efforts in Kenya and Bangladesh. Um, one thing I would say is that the global data is being considered to the extent that it's available in the planning processes. And it's also bringing the indigenous knowledge, trying to understand how are their lives changing, which is incredibly valuable. Um, but the, the forecasts are coming in uh, in, in play in a very sort of broad sense. You know, there's not a very specific downscale data available. And what was also notable was the comment that uh, long run forecasts are a luxury. It's a luxury because you're planning for the immediate. What does that mean is that there's a responsibility that we have to make these global forecasts relevant and in the sense of being able to say, okay, this in long run, this is what the cl climate forecasts look like and what it means in terms of the kinds of houses you need, the kinds of crops you need to grow. Uh, and that translation needs to happen. Uh, and also recognizing the fact that naturally, if you would go to the community planning, the longer run may not be considered. And that's super important for us to think about. Second point I would make is that, as you mentioned, uh, the data availability, the downscale data availability is limited by the capacities of the national meteorological and hydrological um, uh, departments and building capacity of that program and the work that's going on. And I know there's a lot of effort being going on and that process is super important. Um, so there are places where if you are trying to make this data platform, they're going to be knowledge gaps because it simply doesn't exist. Thirdly, I would say that <clears throat> there are efforts ongoing to downscale glo global data. So CORDEX is one of them, coordinated regional downscaling experiment. Um, and that work is trying to take these global climate models and converting into regional climate models, which is really important to understand the variations in topography that may influence the local and community experience. But again, a very important point there that even if that data are available, making that data available into a platform is not adequate, right? So that taking that information and translating it to what it means for the communities requires a collaborative effort with the scientists and with the community to be able to really make sense of that data. So the data is important, but it needs to be contextualized and, and, and we have to work with the communities to make that happen. So overall, it's hard work, uh, but the hard work needs to happen, uh, putting communities in the center and making sure we understand all the constraints that are there to make it available. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to just, just go one step further to say, how are you also finding, you know, we, we've been talking a lot about like different definitions of resilience in the, in the opening plenaries and, um, it just strikes me that that you know there, there, there are many definitions at play, and I think there was a, a, a very important um, point made about communities defining resilience in their context for themselves. So I don't know if, if in this work 
you, you've, you've come across, you know, what this, what, what this, what this means um, in, in the various contexts. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. That is, again, a very important point of reflection. And just wanted to say that uh, the emphasis that everybody is placing on putting communities at center, communities prioritizing the climate risks that are most important to them, and designing climate adaptation interventions that speaks to those needs is vital. Uh, because what it does is it, it basically brings the contextual knowledge that they have the experiences that they sort of have, the capacities that they have to address those climate risks to design the interventions. So for our perspective, what is important is that for all of the local, locally led adaptation efforts, it's, it's really important to be able to show that those efforts are having an impact. So that is a challenge that we have to face across the different um, communities. And if you're looking at resilience, we talked about resilience as a capacity, or resilience as the ability to uh, address climate risks. So as evaluators, when we are coming to it, we would say that, well, what did those capacities and what did those abilities mean in terms of being able to stabilize the well-being, as in to maintain or improve the well-being? Um, and so that means there is a time dimension to it. That means the definition of well-being has to sustain across time periods. Um, and, and then bringing uh, the communities into context, we have to work collaboratively with them to define what that well-being means to them. Um, so I think that the, it's an interesting piece, right? We want to be able to measure with rigor. We want to be able to measure in a way that you can compare across time. Uh, and at the same time, you want to be able to make sure that the communities feel that their definition of well-being, their definition of resilience is being taken into account. So I think the two main things that I take away from it, and I do want to say that it's still a learning process because I think until we have evaluated a few locally-led adaptation efforts, I think it's still all theoretical from my perspective because we have to engage in those processes because we are evaluating larger-scale programs. Uh, which is that it is really important before the, at the time of planning and adaptation, one of the observations, Lisa, that we made was fair amount of information is coming into planning and designing phases, but there is a big data need subsequent to that during implementation and after the programs are over to assess whether, whether that uh, effort had an impact. So if we can come up with a definition of success at the beginning, in a collaborative way where we can all say, you know, here are our well-being metrics, this is what matters to us. And then you're able to sort of say, across different climate stressors and shocks, did you do better relative to that? And I think that, that is a step forward. Yeah, an outcomes-based approach as opposed to just measuring lots of outputs and activities. Okay, great. I would love to go online now to Hannington. Are you with us, Hannington? All the way from yes, Nairobi. Yes, I am. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you, I am. Wonderful. So, Hannington, I'd love to know in your work in the agricultural sector, um, also around smallholder innovation, it would be great to get a sense from you about the role of communities and smallholders as, as innovators and what that means for how we think about evidence, measurement, and resilience measurement. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, uh, 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 thank you for that question. Uh, just building on what Tulika and uh, uh, Cinderella have said, uh, we are aware that uh, the concern for building bridges between local knowledge and uh, global knowledge is uh, uh, needed today than any time before. Um, we also noticed that uh, in the last decade, there has been a lot of focus on codification of knowledge systems. But as uh, Tulika and Cinderella have explained, Knowledge is not merely about capturing, translating, or converting tacit knowledge, with scientific knowledge, into explicit knowledge, facilitated more these days talk of ICT. 
facilitate the knowledge. Um, um, in my work, uh, we've looked at knowledge as differentiated by individuals and organizations based on judgment, based on values, based on beliefs, and also very closely linked to actions. And this is uh, very critical for our communities. I draw my experience from agriculture, uh, both crop agriculture, livestock agriculture, as well as uh, pastoralism. And uh, I have used the word uh, innovation capacity as an important concept. And uh, we have not tried to measure it, maybe from now on the uh, Tulika can try to design a measurement uh, for it. But uh, it is uh, focusing on efforts aimed at moving beyond the generic form of capacity building, which tends to focus on physical, uh, technical uh, competence building in knowledge generation. And as Tulika has said, sometimes we focus so much on planning and the design, and we don't focus on implementation or knowledge use. So we have uh, been working uh, in the crop agriculture and, uh, and, and also in the pastoral, pastoralism, uh, trying to link knowledge creation to its use by integrating knowledge and the practices of farming communities. And I have said whether it is crop or livestock or pastoralism, these are important actors. And now another important factor which is emerging is that communities are not just made of uh, smallholder producers and traders, but also an emerging group of non-farming communities. These are individuals who are doing something else other than herding animals or farming. And this, uh, these are important actors that we should also consider. But overall, communicating scientific information or knowledge effectively to non-scientific communities, like uh, smallholder farmers, pastoralists, and doing it in a form that it can make sense to them. Um, and also communicating to the public, whether it is at national level or at uh, the regional level or local level. Uh, the, as others have explained, even Cinderella, this involves interactive learning, bringing together scientists, local um, and uh, other knowledge bases, including market mediators. Um, I just want to give an example related to that is uh, in 2016, we carried out a study in one of the driest parts of Kenya, the northern part of Kenya called Trukana County. Um, it was on uh, pastoralism and we are trying to see how uh, climate change is impacting on the pastoral livelihoods and how the pastorals are responding. And it was a very good example where the International Livestock Research Institute had uh, initiated a drought uh, index measure for insurance to build resilience in pastoralism. And they had used uh, um, scientific knowledge, they had used satellites, they had used uh, imagery uh, to capture uh, the, e the images of uh, vegetation in trying to uh, predict where there will be enough pasture uh, for pastoralists. The images were showing very green situations, and when they interacted with farmers and pastoralists, the pastoralists were able to indicate actually the vegetables, I mean vegetation, was very poisonous uh, weed called prosopis. 
And they were saying, if this is the indication that we are actually likely to have pasture, this is not right. They were indicating that there was a need for uh, ground truthing, like Cinderella said, so that uh, they also capture the reality on the ground, but they also capture the information of uh, the local communities. But at the same time, also building on what Cinderella said, the knowledge holders, the indigenous uh, knowledge custodians in the community were also very confused because observing in the environment, they realized that there were sort of changes, changes that uh, they had not been used to. They expected certain plants to flower, they expected uh, a certain uh, wind to blow in a particular direction. They expect birds to fly in a different direction. And watching this, the behavior of these creatures, the creatures themselves were so confused. And uh, so they were saying, we don't know what to say about the changes because even our information, we cannot really authenticate our indigenous knowledge. And they pointed to the idea that their knowledge needed to be integrated with the science and that they needed to uh, be validated. Uh, the last, uh, the, the, the other point which comes out um, is that in building communities and in building what we call capacity uh, for communities to innovate, there are very many elements and one of them is to negotiate and to manage information, to manage resources, but also communities are interacting with the global knowledge. So they needed to understand the legal frameworks and regulatory frameworks in response to both global and local realities. Now, they may not do it on their own, so they need facilitators. They need ability to coordinate the various interests within the community and the interaction between the community and other communities and also at national and global level. There are varied interests and they were arguing that the idea of governing knowledge requires some sort of knowledge brokers or innovation brokers. And these are individuals or organizations who can be able to create space, seek opportunities, and incentives to engage relevant actors at different stages of the innovation process and knowledge processes. So um, I want to leave at that point so that I can come back for clarification if there is no, if there is a, an additional question. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you, the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannington, and for some very powerful examples that you shared, and also for, for reminding us about the importance of knowledge brokers. As CDCAN, we, we, re, we regard knowledge brokering as very, very important, so maybe we need more knowledge brokers to mediate the top down and the bottom up. <laughs> Um, I would now like to go to Kazi, last but not least. Um, Kazi, you've been doing some very interesting work at IDE. Um, IDE works with entrepreneurs, and um, you've, you've really like, developed some very interesting tools around measuring market system resilience, or so measuring resilience at the systems level um, within markets, and some very sophisticated tools um, at the same time, you've been working with uh, human design-centered approaches which are more qualitative in nature, um, really to understand community needs and to tailor your products um, to community needs. So you've been working with quite, quite different frameworks and I'd really like to understand and for you to give us a sense of what your learning has been around working with such different frameworks and, and the, the trade-offs of, of, of that, the, the potential opportunities. So just give us a sense of, of what that looks like. Thank you, Lisa. So Market Systems Resilience Index, or MSRI, uh, ID have been developing it since 2018. 
So how do we define market? So to us, market is in an agriculture systems where households and like, you know, input suppliers and also the output growers all interact into the market space. Now, as a market systems development based NGO, we have to understand what is the resilience level of that market. And that's where that MSRI framework or tool have like in, came into action. And since we have been rolling it out in eight countries across Asia, Africa, and South America, we have learned to iterate it in such a way that it have become sophisticated enough to give us enough information about diversity, inclusiveness of the market. But at the same time, we understood that communities have their own needs, own aspirations. IDE, since its inception, have been working on that ethos that if you, like our uh, founder have, like, you know, have this great code that, like, you know, if you haven't spoken to more than 100 customers into certain level of depth, don't even think about intervening. So on that aspect, we have been iterating on different markets on human-centered design. That is an approach of not only learning by asking questions, but by also observing different types of dynamics from active participant observation. So now that quantitative methods of MSRI that have been developed, and how do we bring up that like you know more participant observation, one-to-one -one interviews, and try to amalgamate that together so that we can have a holistic picture of the market so that the kind of interventions and activities we want to do with the community actually uh, uh, brings together the aspiration and demand from the community. So that is where we have been working um, in, since last year in three countries in Africa, uh, Zambia, Ghana, and in, in Ethiopia. And one of the thing we try to prioritize is to looking into creating that connection with the community. And that started with language. For example, when we went to the southeast uh, region of um, Ethiopia, our uh, like, you know, translator and like our party, like, you know, researchers were all uh, wanted to talk in Oromo language with them or communicate to a certain extent, or in northern Ghana in Dagbani language. So this creation of like, you know, long-term understanding and being with the community to observe the power dynamics, gender norms, or the way that like, you know, different other social aspects work on, help us create the trust. And when we try to communicate that MSRI findings with them, for example, what did we learn from these three countries? We learned that market actors, let's say input sellers or output market actors, they, uh, they actually like, you know, do not uh, cater specifically to women or poorer households. So they're like more of like, you know, kind of on a very over the top kind of like selling methods. So that means that disenfranchise these people who need the better inputs more. And when we talk to the, com went to the community uh, who are like, you know, marginalized smallholder farmers and particularly women farmers, we got to know from them that like the land they have is very scarce. So it's not that they have particular crops for like, you know, uh, for household consumption or particular crops or livestock for like, you know, selling. It's like, you know, they try to mitigate and manage based on different like aspects and economy of that particular situation. So as they move forward with those sort of activities, uh, they want to have better access to like better input so that they can grow more. But there is always an affordability grab and also like, you know, not having those co inputs in sufficient quantity. So as such, uh, what we, uh, like, you know, um, in such, so we see that there is a gap between what producers want or community want as farmers and what the market or market actors able to provide it to them. And on to the secondary level, what we understood about like, you know, like gender dynamics of the year. Yes, households tend to like, you know, male and female uh, uh, partners have tried to talk about different agriculture problems and things. But when it comes to decision of spending, 
that actually have certain embedded gender role uh, that's like you know very hard to broker into. And um, the other thing is uh, we have learned that the output markets, people who try to sell, sorry, like you know purchase goods or agriculture produce, they also want to buy directly from the farmers, but they cannot because there is already a strong like linkages of middlemen. Interestingly, women, they do not want to sell goods to the, these middlemen. They want to sell directly to the consumers because that way they can get most of the profits. But uh, to, to certain extent, their um, like, you know, monthly expenditure have a big amount of like, money that's spent on like, you know, for their transporting their goods to those consumer markets. And different situations, they actually can't really go and sell they, those produce they actually want to sell to different markets that have can give them better like you know return for the investment of time and resources they are doing so that understanding of translating those like you know data of like you know quantitative data that we have learned from market system resilience index and what we found from human centered design observation help us understand that their financial need of and the market linkages need can be met through creating uh, like you know social groups that is a common way but what we also try to do is to bring on mfi and other actors both from government and non government to create a market ecosystems around these women entrepreneurs and farmers and we are hoping that next year when we do that we will see a like you know jump into those indicators that will help us understand whether our work had impact onto those people's life thank you thank you kazi very also another powerful example of how we can start to find common ground i'm aware that we are getting getting ahead in time so we'd love to open it up now to to all of you for any questions to our speakers so we'll we'll have a roving mic Yeah, a quick one. Thank you. I'm Johannes from Arin. Um, there is there seem to be a challenge uh, in terms of defining the what is community led and what is elsewhere led. So where do you draw the line uh, to say this is really community led or this is I don't know elsewhere led? Because you know the conversation is in such a way that there's need for some meeting point or connection. From your experience, I would like to hear that. Thank you. Hi, thank you. My name is Joshua Gada. Thank you all for the presentation. My my question is around um, is around knowledge because we've spoken a, quite a bit about indigenous knowledge, and I know Cinderella, you mentioned how uh, with uh, climate change. Um, indigenous knowledge goes so far and there's a need to complement it with climate information systems and the rest. And my worry is that sometimes that has the power to almost devalue indigenous knowledge that in itself it is not sufficient. And yet we know that at the root of resilience, uh, one of the things is a, a community's ability to use its own knowledge effectively. Now, if climate information services has evolved over years to be able to predict in the face of climate change. One would argue that indigenous knowledge that has been around for thousands of years has that capacity as well. So uh, is there any focus, is there any work being done on valorizing indigenous knowledge so that it remains relevant in itself and able to serve communities? Because as you mentioned correctly, some of the modern climate information services under the current socioeconomic conditions will never reach these people and their indigenous knowledge is all they'll have. Now, if it has been valuable for, thir for thousands of years, why does it stop being valuable now and need to be complemented with other knowledge? Thank you. Great question. We have questions here. Yeah, I, I think that the answer to that comment maybe came out when some of the other panelists um, comments as well, it's the, the fact that we're experiencing unprecedented changes today, especially with climate change. And I, was, I had a question for Cinderella. I'm wondering if, 
um, in the communities where you work, if people have experienced these kinds of situations that, are, that your fellow panelist was mentioning where they're experiencing changes that they don't know what to do with now and they're wondering, you know, what is gonna happen in the future and how can I get the information that I need to, to figure out how to adjust my livelihood for that future climate or the future environmental conditions that they're gonna be facing. So I think that these challenges are real and, and the integration need is there. And I'm just wondering if you've also observed some of that and, and how do you think that um, they would be receptive to information that could fill some of the gaps that they're seeing? We'll probably come back for a second round. Uh, yeah, I think that, <laughs> that's enough to chew on for now. <laughs> Okay, so who would like to tackle the community-led versus elsewhere-led? Um, <laughs> who would like to go first? Yeah, I think that's a really great question in terms of where do we draw the line if something is community-led or not. I think based on the experience that um, I have so far, in terms of dealing with the community, a lot of the times there's no public consultation. So I would say we draw the line at public consultation and going back to the communities in terms of asking them the context in which they're existing, existing in what do they feel should be the solution and how? what assistance do they need instead of the top-down approach of saying, we know this is your problem and this is what we, we say you should do and this is how you do it and we are doing it for you. After that, we often see how practitioners disappear maybe after, um, after their project goal has been achieved they go back to their offices or wherever and they leave the communities worse off than, than they were. So I would say the line is drawn at community participation. If there's no community participation, then it's not locally led. And then um, there was a question uh, that you asked on um, situations whereby we've experienced um, communities dealing with unprecedented changes in the environment. We have um, experienced those kind of situations. In the southwestern region of, of Zimbabwe, it used to have like the perfect conditions for kegel ranching. And I think at some point, Zimbabwe was actually exporting beef to Europe and other countries. But because of the changing climate, that is no longer the case. And up to date, you still find farmers holding on to large heads of cattle because that is all they know, despite the losses that they incur year in, year out because of drought. So it's also difficult for farmers to move on from what they have known for such a long time to maybe looking into other forms of livelihood that is not maybe cattle ranging or trying to do something else because I think there's that resilience or attachment. Also going back to the um, question that, that you brought up of this indigenous knowledge system that has existed for thousands of years, but because of the rapid rate at which the climate is changing and um, the connected social economic um, factors as well that have an influence with regards to that, it means that indigenous knowledge systems in some context might not be as relevant as we want them to be. That's why there is need for complementing the indigenous knowledge systems with um, whatever we have at our disposal, even if it means using indigenous knowledge, even if it means using meteorological data or scientific methods, not to say that we are um, invalidating indigenous knowledge systems, but we are trying to make sure that our communities get the best that we can in terms of giving them the right information, them being able to interpret that information to, to utilize within their context in terms of building um, adaptation. Hi, oh, and then I'll pass it here. Okay, so um, I want to kind of raise a community-focused measurement challenge that I have. Um, so when we talk about communities, you know, I think we, me personally, sometimes I tend to kind of 
homogenize things and think of the community, you know, but it's really a bunch of different people living in maybe one area. Um, so what are some strategies that you've used to really try to untangle that? So how do you, um, you know, let's say in a data collection, you know, we consider community needs assessments, maybe in like a startup phase of a program and you're doing your contextual analysis. Um, what are some strategies that you've used to be able to, you know, kind of not look at the community as one homogenous group and to be able to like meet needs of different groups within that, if that makes sense. Um, and just, yeah, just wanting to hear from you all if you have any strategies. I can uh, answer this question. Uh. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Kunal uh, from Catalyst Group Incubated Community Action Collab. Um, Kazi, thanks. You know, you brought the Market System Resilience Index. I was in two parts to whether to attend this one or the track five. So that resolves. <laughs> this seems to be the most comprehensive uh, track. <laughs> um, the question that I had is, if you could throw some light into the indicators uh, that you have uh, in the MSRI index. And um, we are also looking at developing an index for community and uh, ecosystem. And uh, one of the challenge we are envisaging is the adoption. And uh, adoption by market players, uh, by government agencies to orchestrate actions, uh, right? So is there any, are you, are you, what has been your learnings? Are there any challenges in getting the adoption part? Thanks. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Isabel from Goal. And yeah, so questions about, okay, community-led. We're talking about what community is experiencing and how. Um, and so I'm, I'm now working in lots of um, fragile settings. And yes, the communities we are working with are also suffering from climate risks. We've been talking a lot about climate risks, but they're most concerned about uh, conflicts violence, outbreak of attacks. So how to measure also resilience to those type of, of risks is very important. And for them, that's the most pressing issues. Climate risks are, okay, we have some floods, we will have more floods, we will have heat stress, or, but now we have attacks and we need to deal with that. So that's one thing, how you're dealing with that. And, and I've heard a lot about also livelihoods and agriculture and markets. But when you listen at the women as well, there would be may sometimes, most of the time, more concern about health and education. So are you also tackling those uh, at community level? Yes, we can do that. Thank you. Uh, so uh, to start with, how do we uh, like you know make a homogeneous market systems to specify like you know different actors or different types of interest groups so we do that in IDE by looking into the value chains so let's say um, there are like you know 10 types of crops that are grown in an area and we try to identify like with the community and like you know with agriculture extension agents of the government what are the like you know most predominant like you know livelihood like generating um, crop or like you know livestock value chain, and then we try to identify by like you know uh, talking with who are the input side of these like you know uh, actor and who are the output side. Let's say in cattle or livestock, um, if someone uh, like you know people who sell vaccine who sell feed, these are the like input markets. Whereas the output markets are the like middlemen who s buys uh, those cattle and sell it to like another you know, city or other areas. So we try to talk with each of these people and then try to understand their motivation, their interest and their problems. And that's how we try to like cater to the question. Coming to your, yeah, how do we disaggregate the like, you know, indicators? So in market systems resilience index, we have 11 indicators and five principles. So the five principles are like you know broken down into that eleven 
like you know indicators. So uh, let's say diversity. So diversity, uh, inclusion, and also um, integration. They are all like you know grouped together, and they all have equal weight, and that are going to aggregate into like principle of like you know uh, that particular uh, let's say preparedness, and um, in that same way like you know preparedness, financial, environmental, each are like you know segmented into different like you know uh, different um, aspects and each have different level, level of question that help us like you know generate score for each of those areas. Coming to the adoption uh, part, uh, so. Uh, so far, uh, MSRI, we are we have done it as an ID as an organization, and we have been talking with different other partners so that they come and adopt the this framework. Uh, so we have a lot of learning from our like you know scaling it up in eight countries, um, but one of the pertinent year of adoption is that um, is that like you know people uh, like you know like accept the findings, but what we are going to do about to improve those kinds of things that have various ways of looking into things. But as projects are like, you know, certain amount of time bound, that is where, and also budget bound, that's where we stumble upon uh, onto different, uh, like, you know, priorities. But as we go towards, like, you know, working and learning more, we feel that, like, we will be able to fill that void of, adoption and like you know actually partnership with other organization uh, helps us like you know not trying to create a lot of framework but improve one framework in such a way that like you know that becomes industry benchmark coming to um, the lady from goal um, her question uh, conflict is a very like you know um, like never escaping um, like you know, condition in many of like uh, countries where IDE works on. For example, Mozambique in northern area in Cabo Delgado where we work, Islamic insurgency, like you know, chase our stuff on frequent level. But um, that's the reality. Um, as much as climate change, like you know, there are like you know, um, every year there would be like cyclones or like heavy rain downpour. But people actually fear more about those conflict situation and women are always afraid of like you know many of the situations that like you know abhorrent in this century as such market actors and market players private sector do not want to go and work into those communities to build the supply chain because of that fear factor there are things that are out of our control and we can only like you know work into the fringes of what is best for those communities, but not really go into deep uh, as much as we want to because of fear of our own lives and lives of the community itself. So these are like very much overarching, systematic, and by like, you know, kind of unfortunate circumstances. And other than like, you know, trying to mediate and resolve with wider community, um, we are kind of helpless. Okay, it's a very sad reality that we have to close off now, but please do hold your questions because this is just the first segment of the community's track, so we'll be, there'll be lots of opportunity to, to ask similar questions as we go through the afternoon, so please, please hold your questions or chat with people at tea, and I want to just thank the speakers again. Thank you, thank you. for a very, very, very thought-provoking session, and thank you, Dr. Dame. And so nice to have you here. Thank you. Wonderful. So I'd request all of you to stay because we start our next session immediately. Uh, sorry, it's kind of, <laughs> it's been designed that way. I didn't do this. <laughs> but maybe we, maybe we kind of um, get up and move a little bit if you want to. Um, I'd request the speakers to stay and, um, okay, maybe a five minute break and we come back, I think. <laughs> I think everyone just walked away, but please do come back. <laughs> Don't go, we have a fun session. <laughs>
So everyone online, uh, we are starting in five minutes. If there's anyone online, uh, please note we are starting in five minutes. Right, welcome back. 
can we request you to empty the tables, please? Can we request you to empty the tables, please? <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> and uh... <laughs> so do we have our speakers here? We have... Yes, we do. Can we stream Sai up here? Yeah, can we pin her up? Great. Uh, we have with us Sai. Uh, so we're going to start the next session and I'd like to invite, start with invitations to the speakers. I'm, I'm sort of going with the flow here, so pardon me if I'm, you know, jumbled up in my head, mostly because we thought of this as a very different marketplace session. Uh, but uh, the, the setting of the room and the fact that we have like stationed, uh, stationed cameras is kind of uh, making us change the way we work with this. So how we'll do this session, and the session focuses on the how, which is essentially about uh, how do we measure what we measure? And um, again, setting context, where data is scarce, where problems are fuzzy, uh, scales, complicated, complex issues and uncertain uh, futures, how do we how do we capture the evidence? Uh, we heard from we heard from the speakers in the earlier session about the need for finding common ground, the need for uh, knowledge brokers, the need for the role of the expert uh, as, as that facilitator between the communities and, uh, and data. And, and the fact that data itself may, may, may not, data and information itself may not be as value neutral as we think it is. So we're what we're trying to do here is broaden horizons and think of other ways in which we can capture data, capture evidence. So it, it need not always be a, a complex model. It need not always be an econometric system. It, it need not even be a set of indicators for that matter. It could be, it could be different ways in which we capture, disseminate, identify evidence and, and create dialogue around it, right? Because that's, that's what we need at the end of the day. Why do we need evidence? Because we want to, we want to create dialogue around it. So, uh, so in, in that vein, we have four speakers today. We have Sai Girdhari, who's online, who's join, joined us online from India. Uh, she works with the Nature Conservation Foundation, uh, and uh, they work on something very interesting called Season Watch, where they train people how to look at trees, which people anyway do. And they found out that trees do wonky things. Uh, <laughs> Which is, which is, I think, a fun way to say that data is complex. And even if we get data, it's, it's already complex. Uh, we have a video, which I'll just kind of get streamed. Uh, and Sai, I'll leave it to you to introduce yourself uh, while we do that. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's such a pleasure to join all the way from India and to also have hear other people talk about their interesting work. Um, my name is Sai, um, and I work as a project coordinator for the Season Watch project that Shruti just mentioned. And uh, the project is an all India project, and my job here is to work in one of the states that I reside in and train people here, reach out to them and tell them about the project. And uh, hope that they start contributing data by observing trees around them uh, to the project. Uh, and they do so using the Season Watch Android application and uh, website. And as Shuchi mentioned, I wish it was that common for people to observe trees, but it's not. So we have to begin with um, encouraging people to look at trees, telling them ways uh, of doing that, and uh, also telling them how interesting and beautiful trees innately are and how much we can learn about our surroundings once we start observing them more keenly. Uh, you might have heard of something like 
plant blindness where we just ignore everything green around us thinking that it's just greenery nothing more and we don't give extra thought to it so that's where we start uh, working on uh, with when we reach out to people and uh, today i'm going to talk about some data that very motivated and uh, people that have religiously added data to the project and we've analyzed it and found some results and that's what you'll be seeing today thank you Thanks, Sai, and thank you. I stand corrected. I watch trees. I don't know if others do. <laughs> Can we have the video, please? Hello, everyone. My name is Sai. Thank you, Resilience Evidence Forum, for giving me the opportunity to talk about Season Watch, a project that tracks climate change through the trees in India. It is known that trees across the world follow seasons with respect to their leaf flowering and fruiting cycles. Trees have been found to be sensitive to the climate change induced alterations in the seasons. Studying these changes in the tree phenology is easier in the temperate regions as the trees are highly sensitive only to temperature. But in the tropical parts of the world, tree phenology is influenced by numerous other factors like precipitation, day length, temperature, um, along with population, species, and communities. This makes it difficult to generate long-term and large-scale data on tree phenology. But the solution to this is citizen science, as shown by projects like the USA National Phenology Network. Season Watch, a citizen science project, has been around since 2010. School students, teachers, and nature enthusiasts across the country are contributing data to the project by observing trees around them. They upload um, this data using Season Watch Android application or website. We're reaching out to more people by forming collaborations with environmental and educational institutions across India. The project monitors 170 tree species. Uh, the tree to be observed should be a mature individual producing flowers and fruits. The contributors collect the GPS location of the trees along with the species name and the date of observation. The trees can be observed regularly, that is once a week, which makes it 52 observations in a year and casually, that is one observation per tree individual. Observations are made on stages of leaves, flowers, and fruits, such as new leaves, mature leaves, dying leaves, buds and open flowers, and unripe, ripe, and open fruits. These stages are called phenophases. The data collected using one-third rule in terms of none, phenophase absent, few, phenophase in one of the three parts, and many, phenophase in two or all parts of the canopy. This data is verified uh, against a reference database derived from regional floras and citizen science platforms. Verified data is then analyzed to find temporal and spatial patterns in tree phenology and weather parameters. In absence of other baselines, regional festivals and cultural practices can help identify historical phenologies of the trees. For example, the flowers, these yellow ones, of the Indian laburnum, uh, or white ones of the neem or margosa and orange ones of the flame of the forest trees are used to celebrate harvest festivals in different parts of the uh, country in the month of April. Shifting um, in flowering of these trees is noticed easily by people, which also makes for great motivation for contributing data to the project. 93.23% of the data collected so far comes from Kerala, a small state on the southwest coast of India. The most of the species here are mango, jackfruit, and tamarind, which are culturally important and regularly used in the local cuisine. Data collected on these species was analyzed to understand the environmental variables that influence phenology of these species. This is what was found uh, based on data set of 9,919 observations on mango trees in Kerala. The figure on the left compares the impact of various environmental factors on fruiting of mango. Maximum temperature of the fortnight before each observation was found to be the most important variable that influences fruiting, and consecutive dry days in the fortnight before each observation it was found to have the lowest importance. The figure on dry determines relationship between environmental estimates on flowering and fruiting of mango. The points on left of the zero line uh, have a negative impact, uh, while those on right have a positive impact on flowering and fruiting. Maximum temperature is found to have a positive impact on um, the flooding and fruiting in mango trees. These results also show that the static variables like elevation, slope, and urbanization index have an impact on the influence of dynamic environmental factors such as temperature, precipitation, soil moisture, etc. 
This relationship was also found for other star species of Kerala, which are jackfruit and tamarind, which can be viewed in the reference publication mentioned in the last slide. To conclude, uh, tropical trees vary a lot in the responses to the present climatic conditions. Finding patterns in these responses may require much more observations compared to the temperate tree species. The cultural significance of tree is suitable as baselines in absence of scientific data on tree species. Here's the reference that I mentioned earlier and other ways of getting to know more about Season Watch and reaching out to us. Thanks again to the organizers for this opportunity and you all for listening to me. I'm happy to take questions. Great, thank you. Um, right, I am uh, I'm also going to start inviting our other speakers for today. Uh, firstly, we have Nabil Peterson, who is uh, from Interfere. Uh, then we have Ria from Aranya Design. You guys can come up here uh, for a bit so that our online audience can see you. And then we have uh, Elizabeth Bryan from uh, IFPRI. Welcome to all three of you. And what we're doing here is uh, we have arranged, they have brought what they actually do because uh, all their methods, as you can see with uh, what Sai did and what they, they are all working on are very visual methods. So they've brought their work here. Um, but we're going to ask them to give a short pitch, like a short, very short pitch of what they do. <laughs> and this is especially for the online audience. We will get them to give a pitch. Uh, please leave how they can reach out to you, if at all they want to reach out to you. And um, yeah, and then we'll stop streaming and move to a Everyone's uh, free to get up, move to any of the tables or all three of the tables and uh, speak to them, ask questions, look at their, look at what they've brought and we want you to engage and we want you to um, absorb that knowledge, act as active listeners. Uh, we have sticky notes on each of these tables, uh, so pick those up. Uh, this is more like a marketplace, so if you, they are your sellers and you are buyers of the knowledge that they want to sell, pick those up, <laughs> write stuff down that you feel like, wow, this is something I loved, and, and stuff that you want that should get to the, like, the final plenaries of, of uh, the session. Because remember, we are here to co-create uh, principles for resilience, evidence, and measurement. So if you want, if you have stuff which, which is like, wow, this needs to go in up there, this needs to go into the main sort of conversations in day two and three. Put that up. We have uh, charts up here. June is our uh, note taker who's uh, wave, wave and get up June to show yourself. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, put stuff up there. So, uh, Nabil, over to you. <laughs> I was not prepared for this, but thank you everyone for giving the microphone. <laughs> Um, so I think this morning we heard a lot about community-led initiatives, uh, projects that are community-led or community-centered. We heard questions around involvement and strategies for working with, with people, whether it's communities conceived of as physical spaces or online spaces. And indirectly, we heard a little bit about decolonization and shifting power in research. Um, and I think instead of a pitch, I have a series of questions that guides my practice or the, the team I work with practice. So often we ask what constitutes evidence or resilience evidence, like how, who, who holds that bar, who holds that power? How do we leverage um, arts-based approaches to raise and center and amplify other voices? And how do we find fertile spaces for those voices to challenge the current sort of status quo? Um, other questions that guide us are what are the parameters for inclusion, um, for, for people's voices to be conceived as evidence? And then we've been asked to present on the how-to of centering alternative approaches and lived experience, but rather, I think I will focus on our practice as guided by people when often we ask them, what do you want to do and what kind of voice do you want presented and how do you want to do that? Um, then, fourthly, when we think of sort of publication of evidence, what are the boundaries of this practice? Like, how do we publish? How do we disseminate? How do we co-design? For which purposes? And are there perimeters? Like, why do we continuously feel like we should be pushing this barrier when it might not exist? Um, and then finally, why are we not celebrating these alternative approaches more? 
and why are funding not directed toward these spaces? And we think of community led. I have a, a question, which is always us bringing the funding rather than funding being directed directly to these spaces and we step in as co-creators or facilitators. So considering that we're living and breeding in the age of sort of decolonized methods, shifting research, shifting hierarchies of power in research, we sit in the space of what is the position and space of arts-based approaches for everyone to give their voice. Yeah. Okay, so I'm Elizabeth Bryan from the International Food Policy Research Institute, and I hope you all come to my session because we're going to be talking about games, and I know we all love to play games, even though we're all grown up. Um, so specifically, um, this is research that uses the games, and traditionally, experimental games have been designed to understand people's decision-making processes, what are the factors that influence people's decisions, um, but here we're actually using games as a learning tool. So through playing the game, the players actually get experiential knowledge about common pool resources. In this case, this is a game that was played to help communities um, better understand and potentially also change behavior to better manage groundwater resources. And this is a, a game that's been played in India uh, where groundwater resources are increasingly scarce and there's real challenges around the sustainability of agriculture in many communities. Um, and in Ethiopia, where potentially there could be uh, future uh, issues around uh, groundwater scarcity. And so the idea is to try and build people's learning around the resource and what are the factors that contribute to its depletion, and as well as Ghana. And the findings are interesting because we've learned that people do actually learn when they play fun games, and that it's, it's a lot better than sort of giving people information top down. Um, because they're actually having fun and they're interacting with each other in novel ways and they're actually learning through that experience. And in some cases it actually leads to the adoption of rules for better um, groundwater resource management. So if you want to learn more about how to play these games, please come to my group. Thanks. Hi, I'm uh, Ria from Aranya, and um, we are a small de design and research organization that deploys landscape architecture, architecture and design principles to help communities um, document, evolve, and build resilience within their own traditional water um, and food management systems. Um, hearing the two of them, I want to go to their tables. So <laughs> this is not a great format, guys. But, um, but what I'm presenting today is, uh, is one of the, our projects which is really close to our hearts because it's based in the community that we actually still um, lo are located in. And um, it looks at uh, just, you know, uh, feeding into what you were talking about, uh, uh, and an increasingly depleting groundwater resource. And um, in this region that we're talking about, um, we have a traditional system of lakes, and almost every village is sort of evolved, has you know uh, emerged around a lake. And these lake systems, which are all interconnected and interconnected by streams, are a major resource for hydrological resilience against a depleting groundwater resource. Uh, but these lakes, as they're no longer being used as actively as before, they're sort of losing their importance and. What we uh, worked on here was to build a zine and an activity book that worked with school children to kind of get them engaged with actually collecting physical data of, of the lakes, but also going back to their communities, going back to their parents and elders and um, their mothers and finding out how the ecosystems around these lakes could be used to augment their food, for medicine, for other things that is and you know sort of create an indigenous archive of the knowledge that they already have about their environment um, and yeah we have lots of handouts so come and you know play some of the sort of do some of the activities that we've uh, done with the students and pick up some postcards even if you don't attend <laughs> thank you thank you so much uh, i also want to give Say an opportunity to answer any questions and if anyone in the audience has any burning questions because she has graciously offered to stay. Thank you. So Michelle is going to ask Say a question. Oh, no, no. I was going to ask Elizabeth oh. a question. You can ask her on her table. 
Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. So, uh, with the speakers, I would suggest you ask them, with the, with the physical speakers, okay. I would suggest you go to their tables and ask them questions. But with uh, Sai, who's online and unfortunately can't be at one of the tables, um, we have one question, Sai, for you. <laughs> uh, hi, Sai. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was just curious, this community science um, application that you lead is really interesting. Um, and I was wondering, is the application specifically tied to phonology or uh, is it also trying to pick up long-term trends in how trees are responding to climate change? Um, hi, thank you for that question. Uh, the application is only to pick up the phonology observations that people make. Uh, but on the website, you can do both. You can uh, upload the observations as well as view the trends in the trees that people have uh, from the observations that people have made. And there's a map uh, that you can select the state uh, and the species that you want to visualize it for, the, the phenophase as well that you want to see. And you can see the trend of how it has changed uh, based on the observations that people have made. Great, does thank you. Uh, does that help? Yeah. It does, thank you. <laughs> Great, I think we have one more question. I am, uh, if it's for Sai or, um, all right. Okay, maybe you can ask the question in. Um, Sai, this is not uh, more, it's less of a question and more, uh, how can we help you? Uh, if, since most of your observations are only in Kerala state, and um, <clears throat> is there something, is there some specific areas that you're looking at where we can expand the observations? Because I think that kind of longitudinal exercise would really be helpful for climate change. Thank you. Say, did you get that? Yes, I got it. And I just wanted to mention that we are definitely trying to get data from all over India. Kerala was just initiated um, when the program started and people there are extremely enthusiastic and they also have very close connection with the festivals and the um, the trees there. So we get more data from there, but there is data coming in from other states as well, just not enough to analyze it yet. But it, I mean, we're very open to collaborate and expand this range for sure. Great, thank you. May I request you to hold your question or maybe you can, sorry, I'm just uh, trying to maximize Sai's time here. Thank, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, after analyzing uh, and finding, uh, an, after analyzing uh, to find the temporal and spatial factors of these 170 species, uh, what is the specific species you can advise for Africa? I assume that this research has been done in India, right? So how... Uh, I couldn't hear. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Please go on. Y yes. What specific species from your analysis of the temporal and uh, spatial factors you can advise for Africa? Over. Um, um, I think the species that we have um, like decided to observe through this project, they are very common species that are found almost throughout the country. Uh, irrespective of the elevation and the temperature differences and the geographical variations. Uh, so one way to ensure a lot of data comes in is to you know, select species that are very well known to people that are easy to identify and the phenophysis of which are very easy to distinguish between. For example, it has very clear flowers, very clear fruits that people know how to identify. I think that is the basis of it. And uh, we don't get equal amount of observations on all the 170 species. Some of them are more popular, uh, edible fruits, especially commercially sold fruits. Uh, they are more popular and more popularly observed. So I would also suggest the same for Africa. I hope this Thank helps. you. Thank you. And I think the idea here was not to suggest a species, but really suggest a method in which we can see existing native species. Because what's, I mean, the the beauty of this, this exercise is to hold that plurality and not try to, um, you know, have one, one size fits all uh, methods across the world, but really appreciate the fact that there is diversity. And there is diversity in nature, diversity in people, and we appreciate all of that. 
with that, thank you, Sai. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we shall uh, let you go, and we shall stop streaming as well, uh, because the next part, unfortunately, is for is more is catering to the in-person audience. We want you all to uh, get up and also move chairs from that side so that people can access Ria's table. Uh, thank you very much. This is more of an icebreaker slash logistics exercise that we are working on as we go. Thank you so much. And yes, please organize yourselves. Go ahead and ask questions. Um,